imagination seems to me to be the, the kind of gift of human consciousness, really. I mean, other, other animals may have something we'd want to call imagination, but they don't demonstrate it to anything like the same degree that we do. I mean, who knows what goes on in the mind of a, an Alsatian? I don't know. But they, uh, they've certainly not conveyed it to us very clearly that they have these same capacities. What I mean by imagination is the ability to bring to mind into consciousness things that aren't here in the moment, that aren't in our sensory field. Um, you know, so if I ask you to think about your office, you can do that easily. If I ask you to think about the last hotel room you stay in, that maybe. Uh, though I can't actually do that. <laughs> you know, but, but we can bring to mind things that aren't present. And it's the common currency of human thought. The thing is that it's the most extraordinary capacity because with that we can not only live in the present, we can go to the past. And not just one past, multiple possible interpretations of the past. We can reframe, we can reconsider, we can project forward into the future, and not just one future, but many possible futures. Now, creativity to me is a step on from that. It's, it's applying your imagination, because you could be imaginative all day long and never do anything. To be creative implies that you're bringing something into being, that you're making something uh, that has some originality. So it's, it's putting your imagination to work, and it's a very practical process, and that's my point that you can help people, enable them to become more creative. In a sense, you can teach them to be creative. But you can't become more creative unless you enrich your imagination. To me, the imagination is the wellspring of everything. If your imagination is impoverished, your creative capacities are diminished. It's like, you know, in the f field of athletics, you know, if somebody to say, you know, my intention is to win the 100 meters in London in 2012, uh, but I have no intention of training or eating properly, you'd say, well, good luck with that, you know. But, <laughs> but we'll see how it goes on the day. You know, if you want to achieve something in terms of athletics, you know you have to shape your body. And I think if you, need, if you want to achieve anything creatively in athletics or any other field, you have to nurture your imagination. I'd say two things about it. One is that th they can be totally unrelated. Now, I know all kinds of people, I spoke to them, I interviewed some of them in the book, um, who have no interest in trying to earn their living from this thing they love to do. Uh, I know uh, astrologers, I'm sorry, astronomers, uh, maybe some astrologers, I don't know, but certainly astronomers, um, people who do science, you know, in their evenings and the weekends, people who sing in choirs or play in bands or orchestras, um, people who do part-time community work, who teach, who work with other people, and they are impassioned about it. It's the part of the week that they live for, and it makes the rest of the week much better as a consequence. It enriches everything they do. And if you said, well, Luke, why don't you stop doing that, they would wonder what you were talking about. They'd say, but this is when I am most myself. And I've said to some of them, well, why don't you try and do it for a living? They'd say, well, I really don't want to, because then it's a compulsion. And I just would prefer, I, this is my sanctuary. And, but then other people um, do make a living from the thing they love to do. Uh, but it depends on what it is and who you are. So there's no necessary connection, but there can be. Um, but I also do think, by the way, that in these times of change and uncertainty, you know, when all the old bets are off in terms of a lot of jobs people have done for years, probably your best insurance for the future is to really think hard about the things you would love to do and the, uh, the life you would like to lead now. And I think finding your element is one of the surest ways to finding that kind of fulfillment. And for some, that may well be the route to the kind of financial needs that you need to meet as well. Most of the people I know who are professional writers uh, uh, don't write with the guarantee of money at the far end of it. I mean, some do. Some have reached that point where they know they're going to get the advance for the next big book. But most of the people I know who work in those sorts of fields write anyway. And they would anyway, and if they make money, that's great. But I don't know anybody who ever left school thinking I'm going to be a novelist and make a fortune. I mean, some do, some don't. But it is about getting that sense of priorities right. I mean, most of the people I know are, who've made a lot of money, and I know quite a few of them, are still concerned they're not doing anything with their lives that adds up to anything. And they're still trying to find that. If we haven't learned that in the past two years, that money doesn't make you happy, if we haven't still learned that lesson, we're not paying attention. The first thing, I live in the real world too. Uh, I have a family, uh, I have a mortgage, I have responsibilities, and always have had. 
And this seems to me to be absolutely hard-headed, that the, the compulsion to do things that are pleasurable is not to be denied. You know, I mean, I've, I always find this very interesting. It's like the Puritan thing, isn't it? The Protestant work ethic. If you're getting pleasure from it, there must be something wrong here somewhere. And I, I've never believed that. I've always felt that I've never known in my own life that uh, how it was all going to play out. I never really had a plan. I mean, people write their resumes afterwards, and it looks like it all made sense at the time. But it, it, it only makes sense looking backwards in my experience. I'm sure you didn't know when you were at school you'd be running this magazine and hadn't even conceived of it, and it, 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 here you are. Um, to me, it, it's about recognizing that life is organic and that if you pursue your interests and passions, your life reconfigures around you and you live a different life as a consequence. And by the way, for some people, that comes from being academics. You know, I have a lot of respect for academics. I work with them. And when I worked in universities, I used to have people saying to me, it's all very well for you living in this ivory tower. But you know, I used to have 1,200 students in my department, every one of them having a real life, real issues, real challenges, real crises. Everything that happens in real life gets brought into a university, and it happens there too. A friend of mine ran a, a television company. And he always said to me, you know, I don't know why you're going to universities. Why are you escaping from the real world? And I said, well, you try it someday. And actually, 10 years later, he did. He got a job running a film department. And he said he had never, ever in his life had to face so many challenges and issues as working in an, an educational setting. So I always resist all attempts to divide the real world from the theoretical world. Mm -hmm.